So I'm sharing my slide now. Can you see my slides, please? Can you see my slides? Yes. Okay. Yes, please. Yes. yes Thank yes. you. Okay, so I'm speaking on the theme for this year, World Malaria Day. This presentation will not be long because I'm just focusing on the theme. You are going to hear a lot more. Professor Benka from the program manager, Dr. Dumako Boating. The theme for the World Malaria Day to deliver zero malaria, invest, innovate, and implement. And the logo is what you are seeing on the right. The day is actually 25th April, but this whole week we are setting aside to pay attention to malaria. On the 2023 theme, highlights the need for aid action and further investment to ensure that all the investments we have made over time to this point deserve the maximum impact so that we end malaria once and for all in this country and in many settings and not waste all that we have done up to this point. So the theme for this year is very timely. It is timely for Ghana because it has coincided with a change in the name and a shift in Ghana's focus from control to elimination. So this theme really resonates with Ghana. Now Ghana has made good progress over the years as the program manager will share with you. There's a reduction in malaria cases and deaths across all the regions of the country. We have not yet arrived at the goal of malaria. We are still on the road towards elimination. We are still traveling and we haven't arrived. And if you set off for a destination, and you, you haven't arrived, you don't stop by the road and settle there. We still have to move on towards elimination, which is ahead of us. So I'll go to the different parts of the, of the theme. The first one says invest. And when we say invest, what we are saying is that what is going to be put in, in terms of funding, is an investment, not an expenditure. We are not spending, we are investing. Investments are meant to bring return and the returns. And therefore, we should expect returns when we invest in malaria. We should expect good health. We should expect healthy working days. We should expect fewer days sick and off work and school. We should expect improved school output for students. We should expect good examination results. We should expect following on all of this an increased productivity, a stronger economy than we have today, no haircuts, and uh, people's pensions be safe, among many others. So it's an investment that is worth our while. Elimination is capital intensive, and we need all hands and all funds on the deck. Private sector funds, health sector funds, other government sector like education, everybody, philanthropists, international donors, everybody's hand and their money, not only their hands, their hands should be there, their money should also be on the deck for us to get to elimination. And we need adequate funding. We need it in a timely way to be able to implement elimination activities that we've set ourselves because we have already put our hands to the plow. We can't turn back. We are moving forward. Innovate means that there are certain biological threats that we recognize that are existing that we should take notice of. There's resistance of some mosquitoes to some insecticide in use. Notice I said some. So it's not every mosquito that is resistant to every. And it's not every insecticide that the mosquitoes are resistant to. But there's some. In some other parts of the world, there's partial resistance to some ACTs. Thankfully, this is not the case in Ghana. Anopheles even has arrived in some countries. And uh, we've just been told that uh, it has landed in Ghana. 
I'm sure the program manager will talk about. So when we say innovate, we are saying that new tools must be found through actively funded research. And universities like you has a big role here. New approaches must be found for the tools that we have, that we are not getting the level of coverage, the coverage we should get. There should be new approaches so that those tools that we know effective, we are able to get the maximum impact we should get. There should also be better use of data to direct implementation so that we will maximize impact. For example, data on resistance to insecticide can help us to direct which ITNs should go where. So all these things mean innovate. And the need for new tools is important, but there's a greater need, as I've said, to strengthen the implementation of existing tools. There's a quote in Song of Solomon for those who read the Bible. It's not all about love, love, love. It's 2 verse 15, chapter 2 verse 15. It says, catch for us the little foxes that ruin the vineyard. And we have some little foxes that are spoiling the uh, malaria vineyard. And we need to catch them. If these little foxes are not dealt with, the newer tools and strategies will face the same challenges. Implement, which is the third one, means that leadership is critical for implementation. At all levels, leaders must show leadership. I say this in capital. At all levels, leaders must show leadership. We can't continue to do the same things we have been doing and not making the necessary impact because that is how we have always done it. We must do things differently. We cannot implement interventions in the same way everywhere in the country. It just will not work because people are different and contexts differ. We need to find new and innovative approaches to tailor and deliver life-saving interventions to the most vulnerable and those that are hard to reach. And hard to reach is not always geographical hard to reach. Culturally, some people are hard to reach. Socially, some people are hard to reach. And we must find a way of reaching them, leaving no one. For example, during the COVID era, more mosquito nets were delivered to those who need them than ever before. This was leadership at work. And it happened in Ghana as well. High Biden countries like Ghana are tailoring interventions now based on data. And regional and district health leaders are beginning to step up and lead their teams to make impact where they are. You can also make a difference where you are so that together we drive out malaria out house by house sub-district by sub-district, district by district, community by community, region by region, and finally eliminated from Ghana. So in conclusion, the logos for the World Malaria Day says, time to deliver, starting from my left, time to deliver zero malaria. And it says, invest, innovate, implement. And the question I ask is, are you ready for a malaria-free Ghana? Today, we are ready for a malaria-free Ghana. So that ends my presentation, which is a very short one, just focusing on the theme. I will go on directly just to um, show you the malaria newsletter, which we have released for this year, working in collaboration with the National Elimination program. So the maiden edition was first produced in 2020. It was a collaborative effort, as I said, and the Volta Regional Health Directorate was very much part of this collaboration in producing the newsletter with immense technical support from the director and the staff of the UHAS Public Health Affairs Public Affairs Directorate. So this is the frontage of the first and the maiden newsletter. The second edition came out at the time the vaccine had come out 
and therefore focused on the malaria vaccine. And you can see the va malaria vaccine in the picture on the front. Then we had the third ed edition, which came out. And now we are on this fourth edition, 2023 edition. And that has on the front, as you can see, are you ready for a malaria-free Ghana? Because we, it is highlighting the shift in focus from control to eliminate. It has an article in it from the Western North region that emphasizes the need to do things differently to maximize impact. And I will just click on this and then show you the newsletter. So just to run you through the newsletter, if you can see it, can you see the newsletter? Your screens. Can you see the newsletter on your? Yes, please. Um, can you see the newsletter on your screen? I think you were seeing it's, what, it's, let me just, It's gone. It's gone, let me. Yes. Let me just show you. I will um, just bring up the newsletter for you. I will just take you through what is in this newsletter briefly, and then we will close so that it will encourage you to read it because we want you to read the newsletter. There are a lot of things in it. And we are willing to share with you um, the previous editions, if you would like. Um, so yes, it has come up now. Um, mm -hmm. I'm having a bit of a technological challenge, but I'm there and I'm there now. So let me just um, show, share my screen and then you will see, I'll walk you through briefly. And, and then. So I'm sure you can see the front of the newsletter now, what I was showing before. Can you see it now? So you have a message from me, the director, Center and a logo which typifies what we are focusing on. The editorial theme is there. You have highlights on ongoing malaria projects in UHAS. You also have voices from the field. And we have these sections in all of the newsletters. And these voices from the field is what I talked about from Western region and some of what, what they are doing in terms of making sure that IPTP reaches who they should reach. And you will see from the graphs that they provided that they made a lot of that. Then we have a spotlight on key policy, malaria policy and practice. This is the, the section where the malaria program sends out a message on policy, on practice that they want all of us to get to know. So here they are focused on a shift in focus from control to elimination in Ghana because that is the key things they want to do this time around. Then you have news on malaria, things that are happening around the world, like the fact that Azerbaijan and Tajikistan, which is a tongue twister, have been certified malaria free. And our own Prof. Binka was a member of the certification team that went to certify these people um, free. And we can also be a part of this. And then sources of current information on malaria. These are various links. If you want information on malaria, you'll be able to get them. Then there are upcoming conferences with malaria themes here in this part of the thing. And that ends the newsletter. It's not very long. You can spend one short afternoon reading it and get a lot of info. So I will stop here and I declare the newsletter for this year duly released. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Over to Thank you very much, Osan. Thank you so much. I 
In fact, when um, she mentioned that, are we ready for a malaria-free Ghana? I was wondering, would this thing ever go? You know, but um, it's it's good to know that Azerbaijan and Tajikistan um, are completely malaria-free. So if it is happening elsewhere, then we can also be a malaria-free country. What we are going to do is, I believe that um, we would have some questions uh, we would want to ask, but uh, we are going to have all our four speakers do the talk. And then when we are done, we would open the floor for us to um, um, ask our questions. So what you can do is um, as they talk or as they give the talk, um, kindly put down your questions, write them down, or you can put them in the chat box we will take note of them and then we would let you ask your question or we will read your questions and then we would answer them. Thank you very much, Paul. Once again, um, we are going moving on to the next speaker for today. Um, it's going to um, the theme that is time to deliver zero malaria, invest, innovate and implement and specifically, he's going to talk about the case of Ghana. And to do this for us, we have Professor Newton, Professor Fred Newton Binker. He is a professor of clinical epidemiology at a school of public health at the, the, um, the, um, the, the school is actually named after Professor Binker. And um, he is also Foundation Vice Chancellor of Policy Capacities at National Including being coordinator of the WHO Emergency Response and a member of the Malaria Policy Advisory Group of the World Health Organization. He is currently, currently serves as a member of the Technical Advisory Group on Malaria Elimination and Certification. Um, he's going to give us the case of Ghana. And so can we please welcome Professor Newton Binka to take us through. Thank you very much. Prof, you're welcome. Thank you very much, um, Madam Chair. Uh, it's, it's great to be here with uh, so many people on the line. Um, yes, we are celebrating the World Malaria Day. Uh, we started not too long ago. Today, I'm going to focus on just two or three major areas that I think uh, the Ghana case to start looking at. But first, let me introduce to you, I, I'm not sure how this is going to work. I have to share my screen. Can you see my screen? Not yet. Not but yet. But you are uh, allowed. Uh, have you allowed me? Yes, yes. Okay. Can you see my screen? Not yet, Prof. Mm. So what should I do? Um, turn it to me now, and then I will project for you. Okay. Um, I can send presentation to um, I've made you a course. Try again and let's see. Whilst you send also, then I can. Okay. 
just um, send to me and then try and see whether you can. But I've, I've, I've sent it to you and uh, it's gone. Okay, let's see. Let's go back to the screen. Technology helps, but technology can also become a problem. Okay. Uh, share. We can see now, Prof. You can see my screen? Yes. Yep. You yeah. just need to go to your hand. can see. Okay. okay. So thank you very much. As I said, um, I'm going to try and focus on two elements because this this whole story is is just so much uh, that we can only digest it in bits and pieces. So my first uh, uh, part of my presentation is to share my experiences with a similar um, work I had to do in the uh, Greater Mekong sub-region of Asia, where I was sent to try and take the programs from control to elimination in the sub-Mekong uh, uh, region. And I went there specifically because I knew one day we will get here in Ghana. I will show some of the experiences, but I'll start from the global level, get to the experiences in the global sub-Mekong region, and then I will come to Ghana and show some of the things we've done and also emphasize what we need to do. So I hope I can do all of that in the short time. Next. Wow. What is it? Okay. So as you all know, I tend to uh, involve myself in trying to tell you the gist of what I'm going to say. And I think the way forward for Ghana is to form our National Malaria Elimination Task Force. Uh, I think we need to develop a five-year elimination plan, which we are working on and is almost ready. But as I pointed out to colleagues the last time, usually you start with the formation of the task force and start pushing the the public and the government to make a commitment and you develop the plan with all the partners involved, but we can still work it out. The next thing that I think, and I'm going to focus on is on the web-based malaria data system that we need to develop in order to move this forward. Whatever we do here is going to affect how we manage other communicable diseases and even other diseases uh, across our country. The world is becoming information driven. And finally, one of the major problems we are going to face is for the program itself to start changing its way of doing things, including outsourcing or devolving most of the work on logistics, resources, and everything to the district elimination teams, because this, this has to be a focal way of going forward. Let me remind you when the Global Malaria Program in 2016 developed about a 15 year program to try to eliminate malaria, it created um, this cartoon to show the house that it was trying to build. First of all, we all know about ensuring access to malaria prevention, diagnosis, and treatment. That's a given. And we were to accelerate our efforts to uh, attain malaria-free status. And pillar three is the one that we have to talk about over and over again, because we tend to just talk about it in person. That is the pillar to transform malaria surveillance into a core intervention at par or even be above treatment and also prevention. Because if you find people, you we have, we are, there's a given that we can do a lot about that. And please remember the baseline is supporting elements that look at harnessing innovation and expanding research. And finally, strengthening and uh, the enabling environment. 
So this was then transformed into another cartoon. And I keep on reminding people, and this is another chance to remind you, with this cartoon, the concept that we have a malaria control program died in 2016. We now have a continuum of care from high, moderate, low, very low, zero, and maintaining. So depending on where you are, the cartoon here tells you what you should emphasize and what you should do. And that's one of the reasons why I'm so excited that now we have a malaria elimination uh, program led by Dr. Keziamam. So I won't go into the details of this, but these are the grounding principles that have already been addressed and for us to move forward. It's, we are slowly getting into this shape and I'm hoping that we'll see a lot more by the time we finish these presentations. Including that program uh, strategy that was developed by WHO, it said every country, including what we call today high burden countries, may consider malaria elimination as a goal and adjust interventions so as to accelerate across the transmission continuum from control to elimination. Therefore, an understanding that the process and requirements for WHO certification of malaria elimination should be universal. And in addition, he said any country may set sub-national elimination targets. That means, I mean, WHO always speaks diplomatically. What they are saying is that malaria has, even in any country, is not homogeneous. There are different levels of transmission and the burden and the countries must look at the possibility of doing sub-national elimination. And that's where we are in Ghana today. We are trying to create a situation where we can see the efforts of our labor by trying to take geographical areas, that's our districts, and to eliminate malaria in those districts. So I'm going to focus on setting up the national agenda, quickly go through case management, drug sensitivity, and all that. That is all part of the uh, the beginning, and then I will focus on surveillance as an intervention and give you some examples in Ghana already. As I said, there is the need to establish a functional operational elimination in, 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 um, in the Greater Mekong, we call it a task force. Here we may call it a committee. It must be multi-sector engagement. Ministry of Health will never be able to eliminate malaria on its own. It has to do it with the connivance and active participation of, especially in Ghana, local government, the finance ministry, Ministry of Education, information, the private sector. And I will show you some data why the private sector is so important. The military, the police, immigration, and name it. Many more that I might not put on this list. This tax force has to be at the national level, driving the edge for us to get there. They will oversee the technical and operational coordination of the program, but this is driven by information. So you can see the Ministry of Health is only one arm, which will help them with the technical and operational coordination, but it is not the point, uh, uh, what, the all in all. It will defend terms, its own terms of reference and it will ensure accountability. So this is the example of what happened in China. China's multi-sector collaboration, I'm sure you can't read all of it, but I, I just thought that I'd just go through it. It has the National Development and Reform Commission. That's how they call their Ministry of Health these days. Under that, it had the Financial Department, the General Administration of Customs, the education sector, the commerce department, the culture and tourism department, the department, the radio and television administration, the science and technology departments, the industry and information technology departments, and the military health departments. So this is the type of task force that you have in China that eliminated malaria uh, on the occasion of the 100 years of uh, the Communist Party. 
So we also have to look at how others have done it. And in all the countries that have been so far, this has been the nature of the business. The business, as you will see, as we uh, implement this, is clearly that it's not Ministry of Health, it's not treatment alone that will eliminate malaria. So everybody else has a role to play. And then we develop a plan. This is the plan from Myanmar, and that's what we are working on. They had a vision to eliminate malaria free by 2030. Today, that vision is in trouble because they are at war, and they've been at war for the past five years. But there is progress being made in GMS. Then the National Coordinating Committee, what does it do? It shows it has to drive country ownership and leadership. It has to show country ownership and leadership by making sure that they establish a functional surveillance system to produce reliable and timely malaria data as part of the overall health system so that they can make decisions based on data. They also have to address the issues of local funding, which is one of the biggest important factors. And in, in fact, this is where the Ministry of Health is completely incapacitated because governments see the Ministry of Health as a social service provider and any money that is put inside is like fetching water with a basket, nothing comes back. But they've forgotten that without uh, well, uh, people who are well, we cannot generate any income. So the investment part is here and we, these people have to involve to try and make us work appropriately. Thirdly or fourthly, there is the need in Ghana to look at the training of medical entomologists to assist with the reduction in transmission. Our first goal is that treatment. Yes, we can treat malaria, but we are going to zero malaria means there is no transmission of malaria in our country. And the entomologists have to spearhead this process to be able to say that we may have mosquitoes, but the mosquitoes are not carrying any parasites. At the moment, our level of uh, the capacity on entomologists is completely unacceptable. Um, and we need to do something about that. I'm sure uh, Dr. Keziamam Kez will tell us a little bit about that. Then there's the need for external support that to focus on human capacity in each part of our country. There must be more people engaged in malaria elimination. It is not a small, uh, what, uh, birthday party. No, this is a war. And you need to have a capable army that is going out there to fight this. It's not only on commodities like bed nets and insecticide treated nets and so on. There is much more to it than that. Having said all this, let me remind you that malaria elimination is feasible with our current tools. Now, let me be a bit specific on some of the elements that are raised. If you look at the health uh, workforce, for example, we need to train and retrain most of our people and we need to motivate them. They will become multi taxed to provide timely access to quality care, including reporting the tax performed, reporting, reporting, information, evidence will be completely the, the, the pillar of the game. Private medicine and retail level, we must train those staff because they see most of the patients who have malaria, especially in the urban areas. Maybe not, but in the urban areas, they are the key people. We must make sure that we give them the resources and make sure they report. If they are not reporting what they are treating, we are in trouble. We will not see where the uh, hidden tax are, and we need to do something about that. Then at the community level, these days we have our chips compounds and community workers. There's a need to refocus on that. Um, and having put all this together, my summary for the national malaria elimination programs is that the private sector focus must be the key. It must be technology driven and it must have incentives. We can't just tell them, give us the data, give us, um, treat the people this way. 
And then we don't add them with some incentives. Targeting and tailoring to meet transmission reduction is so important. And we've already started that by the stratification. We will come back to that. Community engagement, participation, and ownership. As so far, I think when you go and tell people in the street today that we are eliminating malaria, they, they will not, there will be no reaction. They'll think it's the same old story. We've heard this over and over again. But life is going to be different when we actually get our boots to the ground for the areas where we are going to do transmission. And we'll come back to some of that later on. So we need a major change that uh, in our posture and so on. And it must be driven by this national um, group. And then there are the supporting elements, innovation and research. That's not the end. There are many obstacles that are going to come in our implementation process that we need to innovate and to do research. We need to deal with the social and behavioral aspects and definitely we need more tools. And all these groups are working, tools are coming. We just said about the second malaria vaccine. Let's hope they come to speed up the process. We need an enabling environment, which is also preparing the people or our communities for elimination. We haven't started the discussions yet. This is a massive communication effort that will change the lives of many people, including our NGOs and our partners. Please, this is another element that must be driven and driven seriously. Now, let me come to where we are with uh, case management, and I'm going to run through this so fast. fast. You are all aware of the current global interventions, and uh, I have not added the malaria vaccine yet because it's not available, but we treat, we spray, we use nets and we test. These are the uh, directions in which we are. But in addition to doing all this, anything that is not recorded has not been done. That is the drive down. When we get to elimination, we will adopt what the Chinese have developed. It's called the Chinese strategy, which is 137, a new strategy for malaria elimination. It's very simple. The case is detected, and by the close of the first day, the case has to be confirmed, whether it's RDT or microscopy. The, by, by the third day, people who have visited the place where the patient is from, they would have had to make sure that they can take all the history and they start what we call the classification. Then, Another group will go there to investigate the foci. So this time we are not only treating the case, but we are also checking for where the transmission will have occurred. So that is the foci investigation and response. And we dispose of the foci. We may have to uh, use insecticides and so on, but that is one part of the change that the public has to be, uh, be it has to be discussed and the public brought, brought on board. When we go to the foci area, we will screen people in the area depending on what we have decided. And we will treat anybody we find to be positive. So we don't wait for the other people to have a positive test before they come to the clinic. Once we detect in the clinic, there's a team that goes to make sure that that is under, um, uh, what, that we've taken care of that foci and we have removed the transmission. Now let's look at the entomological aspects. Map from uh, Tajikistan is bordered by Afghanistan, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan, and China. This is the map of the vectors. This is where the entomology issue comes in. They have a map of the main vectors that transmit malaria there. And they have this map and they follow this map closely to make sure that they can track where transmission is going to happen or where there's no transmission of the vectors that are being used there. And, and remember that they are even in a different system where they have the vivax and the falciparum. So the mosquitoes that transmit vivax and falciparum usually are not the same, okay? So we need to have a map like this and our entomologists have to be following this. You go to another country, this was another one in Hunan, province in China. So it tells you the site of presence of Anopheles minimus, which is the main problem in 
in, in, in China, in, in most of the passiparum transmission areas. This is the one that transmits passiparum, like we've talked Stephen side. But everybody maps where the vectors are, and we are not very good at it so far, at least from what I've seen. We are starting, but we're not. But you can see these countries have mapped this since 1980. Uh, every 10 years, they redo the map, and they see exactly where they are. And you can see the progress they've made over time. And then in support of that, we need to provide the services that monitor both the insecticide and the drugs. So in the Greater Mekong sub-region, these were the places where we were tracking the drug sensitivity. And as you know, it's, it's supposed to be the bedrock of uh, drug resistance in the world. Cambodia has resistant uh, in Cambodia, the parasite is supposed to be resistant to all the four uh, ACTs that we have today. And so we have to set up studies where this data is collected. Ghana has some, but it has to extend it. Now that we are extending our focus to the district level, there must be many more places where we can track therapeutic efficacy and also drug uh, insecticide efficacy because Badness are one of our major tools. That is something that has to be in the fold of the head, 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 headquarters. Okay. Now, let me come to where I'm going to focus the rest of my discussion on is surveillance as an intervention. I think it's the major pillar. And it's underlined by the fact that if you have not recorded it, you haven't done it. And in order to start a surveillance system, we need to go through a couple of things. So the surveillance covers almost everything. First of all, malaria case notification must become mandatory. If people don't report it, then we are not having the good surveillance. Today, most people get treated for malaria and nobody reports it. So the, the, the rules must be changed and must be reported. Case-based malaria surveillance must occur in the areas with low transmission and very low transmission. Then case and FOSA investigation must be done. Drug resistance monitoring I've talked about already, entomological surveillance, including insecticide resistance and the vector foci monitoring. And then we have to do the outbreak detection and response. But that is not only what the FOSA, uh, the surveillance has to do. In fact, the surveillance must have a malaria data repository that contains everything that we are doing, which is sitting on top of the National uh, Man Health Management Information System, or the DIMS. This means that the programs or the software that any benevolent uh, panda gives us must be able to talk to the DHI, uh, District Health Management Information System too, that we use today. If he doesn't talk to it, please throw it into the dustbin. Tell the person we thank him very much. We don't need to be straight on, on the path that we are undertaking. This is very, very important. And if you look at this, it will have the interventions, it will have the community issues, it will look at the population, it will look at financing, procurement, resistance, entomology, household service, uh, insecticide coverage, and others. Everything must be somewhere that we can find and allow our uh, national. Uh, tax force or committee to be able to take decisions as to what needs to be done. This is the key. If we don't get this, then we cannot measure the zero. We have to know where we are and we must be getting close to the zero by measuring. There's no way we can do any other way of measuring the zero by doing an estimate. No, the zero and we will, when we come to uh, certify you, we will go and visit the last case whether uh, if it's the person is dead, we'll have to go to the cemetery and make sure that we know that this was the last case. There will be no guesswork. So let's take this. It means that at the moment, the national program has to go back and look at the use of uh, these applications, which can go all the way to the uh, what uh, phones, smartphones. It can go to the um, what, what do you call it? Uh, those laptops. Uh, uh, computers and so on, but all the technologies available today 
in country, if we put together a group of young people, they will create a web-based malaria case surveillance system for us that is sitting on the DHMIS, and that is our only way going forward. Secondly, in the low areas, this is what we did in, uh, Cambo uh, in Cambodia or the Greater Mekong region. We created an app sitting on the District Health Information System 2 that is used in Ghana today, password linked, and it captures the, any malaria reported anywhere in, in the six countries we get to know that there's a case of malaria and where it's been reported. It's, uh, so we, we have the district health information system. We have a malaria model, a malaria case-based surveillance model. This will be then transformed into the Ghana Malaria Elimination Database. So I went around visiting some of these health centers to see how uh, this is being deployed. And I also went to uh, villages and it was really interesting to see that people are bought into this whole business and they are reporting these things and people are checking to make sure there's a report. So in the six countries, this is my visit to Cambodia at the time, visiting their health centers, but just look, the programs are written in their language. They are able to enroll, get people in it. I'm not expecting you to read this because you can't. But then we have what? A so-called uh, uh, the desktop gives you a chance to be able to what? See at a go when you open your computer in the morning, when you come to work or your laptop, you'll be able to see what is going on. In addition, we gave access to many people. So in, in the, the GMS, I had access, the staff in my office had access at WHO headquarters. We had people there who had access. So when you put in the case, they'll get a, a, a small ring saying that another case has been reported. And in all the countries, people had access to the database online basis. We have to get there if we are going to make the lab. Then you also then can generate the data from each of these countries in a very short time, showing how data is working, how the system is working in the six countries, in Myanmar, in Thailand, in the Yuan province of China, in Cambodia, in Vietnam, and in Laos DPR. So these are six countries, but we are able to coordinate this and able to report and see what is going on on a regular basis. Now, my summary of this whole area is that the malaria elimination audit tool, which will build into the uh, database has to have the national strategy coordination and those are the things on your left, the stratification, diagnosis, case management, surveillance, focus in, uh, investigations, vector control, accelerating strategies, prevention of re-establishment and the documents and records for certification of elimination. So it's the same repeated on this side, but these tools are available and we don't need to start from scratch. We can borrow from other countries that have used them. And the, fortunately, they are also using the DHMIS and we can get forward. So in summary, getting to the, the Ghana situation, the Ghana journey so far is that we've had the National Malaria Elimination Program now established from the control. What we need is a reorientation and the development of decision-making and finances to the district level. That will take some time and uh, a big time. If we get that right, we are in business. Second, the development of the five-year malaria elimination action plan, we are deeply in it. And I congratulate the, Dr. Kezia and the team for a wonderful work done. But now we need to form the National Malaria Elimination Task Force, which will be chaired by either the vice president or the chief of staff. We represent this from all the people that I've been talking about and make them functional. They must own the strategy and they must now be calling the shots for us to be able to get to where we are going. That is critical. And they also must do a couple of things which are very major. They must create an enabling environment, preparing the people or the communities for elimination. There must be massive communication efforts 
the private sector integration into the system is so important and people have to sit down and talk to the private sector and find how we can integrate them, the NGOs, the partners. And then we've seen the progress they are making and uh, 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 Dr. Kezia will tell you a little bit more about that. Look at where we were in 2018, look at where we are in 2023. As it pales, it tells you that we're actually moving. In fact, the dramatic one is in the Western region. It was all red, look at it now. And uh, in five years, we've made significant progress. Then they I tried to find out how we are going to integrate this in as we go along. And I'm going to make the case for the uh, well, private sector. These are the health facilities we had at 2019. There was uh, the major... Uh, total number of facilities we had in Ghana was about uh, 7,000, about 8,000 thereabouts. But the private sector has over 1,300 facilities. So they are not a small player in this whole thing. One in 10 of the facilities are the private sector. In fact, if you come closer to it, it's more than that because we are counting most of our uh, uh, compounds as part of this whole thing. So if you, if we go further and you see the deployment of this, you can see the chief compounds in Ghana are taking almost 6,000 of, of the facilities. So that shows you that the private sector, it should not be toyed with. They must come on board now and come on board adequately with government backing and support as we mobilize the whole country to move forward. And we have done the ecological zones and we know where to start with very low and low for at least the elimination but we are pushing very hard on the moderate and high to join the low and, and very low and i must say that this is happening already this is my famous work about what is happening in Bumkuguru yoyo district in northern ghana two years of work by a team led by uh punaman amatia but included names you all know uh um, Kujo Kuram, Benjamin Abuaku, uh, Colin Saholu, and then even Samuel uh, Opong, who is part of the uh, National Malaria Elimination Program, did some work in Bukuru Yoyo. You can't believe it. And this is the mapping of the communities there, which were sampled between 2011 and 2013. They demonstrate very clearly that look at where Bukuru Yoyo is, a very small thing here. And this is what Bukuru Yoyo looks like. But they were able to use the data to show that there are differences in transmission all year consistently uh, over this period of three years. They could show that the rainy season, the transmission is almost everywhere. There's a top panel all the three years. And in the dry season, you can see that the uh, red is, is now uh, what? giving way to the green. The green areas are where there's little transmission. And they could show that if you were trying to implement this in the Bunkuku Yoyo, you don't do the same thing the whole year round. There might be differences in your approach and there must be differences where you attack first to make sure that the malaria transmission gets to zero. So we, we, we have the skills to do this and we must pause this, and this should happen in all the districts. So these are a little bit more maps on that. There's a publication. I think I showed the, the paper. If people want the paper, they can come for it. This is Characterizing Local Scale Heterogeneity of Malaria Risk, a case study in Bukuru Yoyo District in Northern Ghana. In fact, today, Bukuru Yoyo, I think, is split into Yoyo and whatever. But there are obviously things that can be done even in such remote places. Finally, let me say the strategy is still the same. The key interventions are case detection and management. We need to do disease prevention and transmission. But in all of this, to drive the surveillance bit, mandatory notification, case based malaria surveillance, case focal investigation, entomological surveillance, outbreak detection and response, and a web based system which allows us to be vigilant so that the program in any way can find where these things are. In all of this, we need supporting elements. We need innovation. We need to carry the community along. 
because without the community, we're not getting anywhere. The take home message is that a high political commitment will eradicate malaria in a generation in Ghana. The tools to get there now, China has just done it. We will incorporate new tools to get there as the, uh, to get us there faster. So if the vaccines come, they will speed up our, our goal, but it doesn't mean that we are not ready to start. We have to innovate within the health system to increase access to care, license all health workers to treat malaria. Malaria is no more a medical problem. It's a logistic problem, you know, and we are not the best to do that. We have, we have adequate tests to test and we know how, what, how to treat. Ghana and Africa must rise up to the challenge. We are asleep while others are eliminating malaria. In Africa so far, we've had malaria eliminated in Morocco and in um, Algeria, but we should have many more. I think Kiverd is on its way to, be, uh, to eliminate malaria as well. We must increase our interventions to reduce transmission. And let me talk about this word that is not well-spoken most of the time, mass drug administration. The program has to sit down and think about it and tell itself where it's going to use this. Because mass drug administration was condemned for many years, it's back, China used it. Most of the countries I've been to have been using mass drug administration. They just didn't mind WHO, so you continue sleeping. We want to get rid of this business. And if parasites, when you see it, you kill it. There's nothing else apart from that. We must evaluate our health system as we evaluate other parts of, of the plan. So the health system indicators must also be there so that we know which district health systems are working and which are not working. We must increase domestic funding. Please, if you are waiting for aid to eliminate malaria, then it will not be done because after you have eliminated malaria, you have to make sure it doesn't reoccur. And if you don't learn how to put money into it, you will run into serious, serious problems. Adapt a credible multi-sectoral approach to eradicate malaria. And as I say, malaria eradication is possible within a generation. I acknowledge many people who have contributed to this work, and I hope we shall have a good discussion. Thank you very much. Hello. Yes, um, thank you very much, Prof. Um, thank you so much. Um, this is really deep. And I think this is a lot of um, note a few things down which um, um, probably I would also ask and um, also make some comments on some of the things. Um, uh, I, I think to, we'll quickly sorry. move on to I have, I have to stop sharing. I'm struggling to, to find where to stop the sharing. What did he say? Yes, Prof, please, please stop sharing your screen. So we would have the next um, speaker um, who would give us an update on the malaria burden, the malaria burden, time to deliver zero malaria. Um, this will be done for us by um, Dr. Kezia Laurentia Mam. Dr. Mam is a program manager of the Ghana National Malaria Elimination Program. Um, at the Ghana Health Service. She is a public health physician and specialized in epidemiology with a distinguished career in malaria. As the program manager, she leads the strategic direction and planning for all malaria control and elimination interventions in Ghana. Having overseen tremendous progress Control of the past few years. Dr. March to The updates on mal the malaria bed, time to deliver zero malaria. Dr. Mama, 
Thank we are ready much. for you, please. You're welcome. Watching um, the African region responsible for a high share of it, about 95% of cases and 96% of death. And that's why I think it's important, like Prof says, that we wake up. Children under five years and, and pregnant women are mostly affected, and children under five years account for 79% of the deaths in the African region. Ghana, I think Ghana this arrow is, is not at the right, but Ghana is um, responsible for contributing a significant portion of malaria, um, responsible for the, it's part of the 10 highest countries that are highly burdened by malaria. In Ghana, um, the entire population is at risk even though there are differences in, in um, transmission, and you see as I move on, everybody in Ghana is at risk of being by the malaria parasites. And the mortality rate was up to per thousand live bed. Last year, we did the latest parasite prevalence, and it's 8.6. I'll show how we have progressed in the next slide. And our deaths also continue to come down. So our current um, death in terms of outpatients death is less than we had. Malaria is accounting for less than 1% of all inpatient deaths. So it's, we've, we have made some progress. Unfortunately, it's still the highest disease expenditure under the NHIS um, National Health Insurance Scheme. And it's, it has a terrible impact on our gross domestic um, product. And, and that's why um, Prof is saying that investment into the control of malaria and health shouldn't be seen as um, just um, expenditure, but it should be seen as an investment. We have a, a number of um, mosquitoes which are accounting for the transmission. And indeed, from, we have 30 sentinel sites across um, the country, in every region of the country. And the, the most currently, the most common mosquito that accounts for the transmission is the Gambi, the Finestes, and Arabiensis. We've just seen Stephensi, but we don't know yet how much it accounts for our transmission. And um, we've even ramped up surveillance to be able to to um, get to know more about this disease, this um, mosquito. The parasites that account for malaria in our country, at the highest one, the one which is responsible for the highest is the Plasmodium falciparum, um, and unfortunately is the most deadly. So we have been operating a strategic plan that started from 2021 and was supposed to end at 2025. It has three main objectives reduce malaria mortality by 90%, and then reduce malaria incidence by 50%, and getting at least six districts to pre-elimination all by 2025. That was the goal when we started in 2021. And we had rolled out a number of interventions, and it included the distribution of insecticide-treated nets across the country through our routine services, child welfare clinic, and um, antenatal clinic. We also um, did distribution of nets through mass campaigns. We, um, and that was in the districts that we didn't have um, indoor residual spraying. Indoor residual spraying in that particular plan was supposed to have occurred in 43 districts. We didn't have the resources. So we, we implemented it in 24 districts plan. We've also ramped up loud management in 105 um, districts across the country. And in semitent preventive treatment, which takes care of pregnant women, is across the entire nation. Seasonal malaria chemo prevention, where we give um, medicine to children under five in the areas with very seasonal malaria. And currently it's happening in seven regions, northern region, upper east, upper west, northeast, east region, Oti, and then um, Buno East. 
region. So in Savannah region, we are giving the children under five SP and Queen during the highest transmissions of, of the country. And in case is across everywhere, that means if somebody gets ill, we want to make sure it's malaria and we treat the person appropriately. Malaria vaccine is our newest intervention and we are happy to hear options that are coming up. We started 42 districts as a pilot. Currently it's been rolled out to 93 districts and we hope as we move on, we can expand this further. So how far have we come? This picture shows how the map, so this is the malaria parasite prevalence across the region in children under five. And you can see how we have, we have gradually made the, the map paler. The last one is the result of last year's um, survey, which was done as part of the demographic and health survey. And um, Ghana is becoming paler and paler. So we are hopeful that when we put in the right interventions, when we put in the necessary resources, elimination is possible. Deaths in our health facilities to continues to go down, like I said. Currently, malaria accounts for less than 1% of inpatient death. Last year, we recorded 151 deaths in our health facilities um, due to malaria. So we are gradually getting to a point where malaria shouldn't kill anybody um, in our country. And this shows the malaria deaths per 100 um, thousand population. If you standardize this by 100,000 population, it still shows that um, we are going down when it comes to death due to malaria. The picture is similar irrespective of the age. So for children under five who are more affected by malaria, even though their figures are relatively higher, you can see that the, the trajectory is the same. They are all coming down nicely. The death due to malaria is coming down in children under five and in those above five years as well. This shows the regional picture and the picture is the same. If you look at the green bar, which is the number of deaths that occurred across the various regions were recorded. You can see that most regions are recording single digits malaria death with the exception of um, Northern region, Eastern region and greater Accra. So, and, and then Upper West. So indeed we are coming down when it comes to malaria. And I'm hoping that even by the end of this year, we'll see fewer, fewer regions recording anything beyond, um, beyond 10 per region, 10 deaths in a region. Malaria admissions unfortunately continue to increase. Um, this data came in, so we are trying to understand. But I mean, I am comfortable in the sense that they are not dying when they are admitted. So it, it, we have a number of questions to answer the why. Is it because they are admitting them much earlier or indeed the severe cases are, are going up and it's something we are going to look at to make sure that it is reversed. And you can't cry in the Eastern region um, in the last year admissions due to malaria admissions. The picture is the same when you, when you standardize this by um, the population from the regions. So let's talk about uncomplicated malaria. One of the things we have been pushing a lot is, is testing. We, we have been every suspected malaria case is tested before it is treated. And this is, um, is going up. Last year, we recorded 97.8% of every um, suspected case being tested to be sure it's malaria before we treat. So we are getting to a point where every case is tested. There are several diseases that may present with the symptoms of malaria. COVID was one of them until you get to the very large stage, the, the late stage where you see other symptoms related to your chest, the early symptoms of um, malaise, fever, 
not feeling well, inability to eat happens in so many diseases. So this is very important to us. And you can see that last year, the number of cases that were confirmed as compared to the year before has, has come down. So we are making some progress in the number of cases we are seeing. The picture per the region show that um, some regions um, are having higher number of malaria cases per the thousand. If you standardize it by their population, Greater Accra is the one with the least number of, of malaria, whilst we are seeing Upper East in relation to their population having quite a high number of malaria cases in the health facility. So to show you the progress we are making with our interventions as well, um, IPTP, which is our intervention for my, uh, pregnant women, is going up, is going up nicely. And we hope last year we we're able to reach 60% of pregnant women coming to antenatal and having at least three doses. We want to be able to improve on this to make sure that every pregnant woman, by the time, if we really want to do elimination, every pregnant woman has access to this useful intervention. We were able to distribute insecticide treated net to the pregnant women and children under five, sorry, to the pregnant women in the antenatal clinics. And we are closing the, the gap each year to make sure that we reach all the pregnant women as much as possible. So last year, 90, 93% of our pregnant women who went to antenatal received an ITN and 95% of children who went to the child welfare clinic also receive an ITN. SMC, which is an intervention that happens in the seven northern regions that I had talked about, um, also had a very good coverage. It just shows that if we even have to do MDA, depending on the approach that we, we take, it is possible to reach the people who need this intervention. Breaking across the regions, we usually start with a low coverage. You can see OT region started with a low coverage, Upper West started it with a low coverage, but by the fourth round, they have all improved to reach the targets that we set for ourselves of 90% of estimated population getting the intervention. Just to highlight a bit about the malaria vaccine, um, last by the end of December 2022, for the third dose, 73% of estimated children have re received their doses. The fourth dose is where we have 52%, which is usually lagging behind um, the, the others. It's given to children around eight, 18 months. So it's usually difficult to get um, all the people come in at that time. In summary, um, when it comes to our indicators, I think we have done quite well hitting close to or sometimes above the, um, the case that it is the one we are struggling with is the indoor residual spring, where even in the areas we do it, even though we are able to hit our target of reaching the households in the community, we've not been able to cover all the districts that we set ourselves to have indoor residual spring. We wanted to do indoor residual spring in 43 districts because they were high burden districts, but we're able to do that in only 25 districts. So with the current, with the last strategic plan that we, we implemented, we can say that um, using the baseline of 2019, um, as, as, which was the baseline for that strategic plan, when it comes to malaria deaths, we are on track. We said we would reduce by 90% by 2025. As, the, as at the end of 2020, we have reduced by 53%. Same for under five case fatalities. I think what we, we need to do more is uh, um, incidents for malaria. We, the admissions, as we saw, has increased um, by 8%. But the, the, the cases have reduced by 20%. So there is more work to do 
when it comes to testing, we are on track. So with all this talk, indeed, we have changed the focus. That is why strategic plan, I kept saying that strategic plan because we are changing the strategic plan. Ghana is going elimination. And the question being asked is, are you ready? And people say we are not. We are not there yet. We are starting and we will get there when we start right. It was, there was a unanimous call for led very much. And so our name has been changed from malaria elimination control program to elimination program. And it's not just talk. We have had an orientation with the parliamentary group. We have formed a parliamentary caucus. We have the commitment of parliament on this elimination agenda. We have put together um, our strategic plan. And indeed the tax team will be formed. If this, we are working with the chief of staff to be able to make sure that we get the task team form to, by the time the plan is being launched, hopefully the task team will be formed and we'll all start with this um, shift in the way we do things because malaria can't continue to be normal and be with us. And elimination is where we are going to see no incidence of locally acquired malaria infection in a particular geographic area. Like Prof said, we don't need to have the whole country eliminated. Um, we don't need to have malaria eliminated in a whole country before we say um, we, we are going to do elimination. We can start in areas which are very low and then gradually extend it like other country did. And that's what we, we mean by subnational elimination. So we have gone through um, um, WHO's malaria elimination um, assessment to, to assess ourselves to see where we are in relation to elimination. We have done a lot of stakeholder engagement and we are not done yet. We have, we will continue to do more stakeholder engagement, especially with the ministries outside Ministry of Health. We have finished our midterm review and we are finalizing the elimination strategy and we'll finalize it even more when we get the more. We all, we've already had inputs from other ministries, but we want other ministries to even own it more before it is finalized and then launched. So in this plan that we are doing, just to show you what is going to happen and Prof showed the last match, there is some strat there is stratification where we've put in all the data that we we have to show um, at the district level what is happening with malaria. And you can see some areas are blue, others are red. So we are going to zone the country into very low, low, moderate, high, and very high. Some interventions, yes, this picture shows it much better. And already we have 21 districts that will be in the very low region um, zone. We have eight districts that will be in the low um, zone and then have the moderate zone in about 83 high and then set up interventions to tailor to these um, zones. So we start gradually, but we'll get there. The main um, objectives, the main goal of that strategic plan that we are developing now is to reduce malaria mortality by 100%. That means nobody should be dying of malaria. Yes, we'll all die eventually, but when it comes to malaria, we want to make sure that you don't die of malaria because it's treatable. And then we reduce malaria incidence to by So we, at a minimum, we have to have the, the 5 million and bring it down to um, 2.5 million by 2028. But we, we hope that we can even do better, especially with the new things that we introduce. I'm not going to go through all the objectives of this strategic plan, but just to highlight the new additions. Apart from the fact that now we are hoping that all the interventions, we are going to work towards all the interventions being 100%. We want to increase um, uh, surveillance. So we will indeed get to what Prof has described, where we do active surveillance for the very low um, areas, such that when we are getting malaria cases, we can follow up and stop the transmission as quickly as possible and make sure that every full infection 
as, as, as um, eliminated as quickly as possible. So these are the proposed interventions. The current existing interventions will all go on. We won't stop them and I've already gone through, but there would there will be additional interventions. So malaria vaccine, we are working towards increasing the coverage of the malaria vaccine. Yes, we don't know if it will be the new vaccine or it will be the old, but currently we are working with what we have. And indeed, we'll be introducing mass drug administration. Um, and I think key, we are starting with a low transmission. Uh, we, we are going to start with a very low transmission um, district. And we also will introduce, in a way, another form of mass drug administration in school children. And this, we hope to go beyond the very low um, district. As we learn lessons, we may be able to change this, um, this um, the coverage and move on so that eventually we would have um, the malaria elimination we are looking out for. What we'll also be introducing is post discharge malaria chemo prevention, where um, once you have severe malaria and anemia and you are going home up into medication you don't fully recover it and will enhance um, surveillance nationwide we hope to gradually get to a point of case based surveillance nationwide but it will be um, a um, work in progress and a targeted approach i have talked about this so i'll just um go um on I think one of the things that is key for malaria elimination is enhancing political will, community ownership, and then multi-sectorial coordination. Our prof has gone through all these, so I won't elaborate, but it is key and as a program. It is not it's something we, we can't say we are doing elimination without, so it's something we are really going to push for and work towards. And Prof Ansan also highlighted what the, 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 the theme for this year means. So I'll skip this one as well. Now we have challenges. We do have challenges, even we, we aim at going elimination, but we hope um, to work at these challenges. And some of these challenges include the way we use the insecticide treatedness, people owning it and using it the way we has to has to be done, it's not optimal. We still have people who are not adhering to treatment. Sometimes because the anti-malaria is so effective, we start from day one and by day two, we are better and we don't complete. And some, we still have a small proportion of people like 3% not testing to be sure it's malaria before they treat. We hope to be able to address the issue of suboptimal um, coverage of some of our interventions like IPTP and continue to look for resources to fill the gap when it comes to indoor residual spring, whilst monitoring to make sure that we, um, we don't lose, um, we, we, we maintain the efficacy of our tools, insecticide resistant tools by managing our, our resistance um, for insecticide indoor residual spraying and insecticide treated. So I will end by calling all of us, my job, Prof. Ancest's job or Prof. Binker's job. Ansa has talked about it. When we get to elimination, the question being asked, are you ready? you won't be sitting there for somebody to come and give you something to do. You will have to own it and take up the, the mantle to do what you have to do to make sure that elimination is achieved. It will, it will include ensuring you don't have breathing site. It will include yourself working to get some medication to, to clear the parasite if you are doing MDA in your area. It will include making sure that you test to see if it's malaria before you treat and reporting um, appropriately what is expected of you to make sure we win this fight. So let's invest, innovate, and eliminate malaria for a better Ghana. I do acknowledge all these people in my presentation and in the work that we do. Thank you. Please follow us on any of the social media links. 
Thank you very much, Prof. I will stop sharing. Thank you, Dr. Mam. We are so grateful. That's a really comprehensive um, presentation, which has given us an idea of where we are, where we are going, and all of that. And um, the question is still valid. Are you ready to have a malaria-free Ghana? We have to answer, yes, we are ready. We cannot continue to live in this mosquito-ridden country. We have to decide not to breed our own killers again. We should stop breeding our own killers. I would just take this opportunity to acknowledge the presence of um, Carmen Major, who is the executive director of Defeating Malaria from the Genes to the Globe Initiative at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Have, um, Carmen, we are grateful that you joined us this morning. Um, they are our collaborators, and we are happy that you made time to join us this morning. Thank you, Carmen. Um, can we see you briefly, Carmen, if you are there? Hello, Carmen. She's there on, I'm sure she will speak later on. So I will hand over to um, Dr. Edu. It's a team. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Sansa. And thank you once again, Dr. Mao. Um, very deep indeed. And the word is elimination, elimination. So we move on to our final, um, our final talk for the day or presentation for the day. And um, for this, we are going to be talking about the role the role of subnational health leadership in the progress towards elimination of malaria in Ghana, the case of Bono East region. And to do this for us, we have um, here with us Dr. Fred Adumanko Boatin. Dr. Fred Adumanko Boatin. Dr. Boatin, Adumanko Boatin is the Regional Director of Health Services in the Bono East region. He was previously the deputy director in charge of clinical care and also the head of surveillance in the Ashanti region. He is a national facilitator for several key programs in the Ghana Health Service, such as the case management of malaria, malaria in pregnancy, infection, prevention and control, among others. He is a member of the Ghana National Technical Experts Committee for Malaria. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, let us welcome our final presenter for this um, program, Dr. Fred Adoko Boatin. Dr. Boatin, you are welcome. Thank you. So I'll, I'll straight away share my slides. Okay. Uh, standing on the uh, exception protocol. Uh, Garnering from Prof. Baker, uh, Prof. Evelyn, and they are my lecturers, and then the program manager for National Malaria Elimination Program. We can easily see that there is no one size fit all. And Prof. Baker made a very pronounced statement that is in the elimination the intervention is at the district level. Therefore, we see that for us actually to make elimination an achievable subject, the sub-national health leadership should be really, really strong. And, and so that's what we are going to present. We noticed that the program manager listed a lot of interventions that are going on, but it's still not doing well. For example, she said that the IPT is sub optimal. The treatment, it's in such treatment bed nets, people are not really using them. But you will see that this is not across. There are some districts 
which are really doing well as compared to the others. And therefore, I come back that, look, for us to really progress in the elimination agenda, leadership the key. I, I will still want to drive on this using the team for national malaria, the World Malaria Day. So this is going to be the presentation of the outline. I'll basically talk about the profile for Bunei's background. Uh, I'll use some selected indicators to make a case for SMC. We will look at the performance for seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis for 2021. Then we will look at the gaps that we realized in the 2021 and how we address the gaps in achieving the targets for 2022. And then I will do a quick sum up. This is the profile for Bunuis. We have 11 districts. So you see where we share border. We share border with Uti. We share border with Ashanti region, Savannah, Ahafo, Buno, and the Northern region. The total population for Greece is 1,254,474. We have 372 facilities. And you remember when Prof was actually talking about the total number of facilities that we had, most of them are ships compound. It's the same over here. About 77.4% of the facility types in Greece are ships. We see the hospitals are about 4.6, and then the health centers are about 9.9. .9. So that's what you see. In terms of ownership, government facilities are making up to about 89%, and these are mostly chips, zones, and compounds. Then the private, we are making up to 8.9%. Now, when we talk about time to leave, yeah. We have innovation. That should be innovative. Only at the national level. Only at the level or know that there is no one side which is going to be for you to innovate, especially at the implementation side. Because if you are not really careful and you think that you are just going to implement any evidence without taking into consideration your context, then you are going to have a serious challenge. So that is very important. Wherever you are, whether as a regional director, whether as a district director, whether as a sub-district head, there is a need for you to innovate in terms of the context. It's very important that we look at that. It's based on that, that for Bunuiz, you will see that not all the 11 districts are part of the seasonal, seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis. And this was based on data. Um, just using this to show the role of leadership to come to elimination. Because if you don't emphasize on leadership at all areas, then you're going to implement all cross board. But for elimination across it, we shouldn't go that way. So based on the data that we have across all the 11 districts, only five districts were selected for seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis based on some indices that we're looking at. The seasonality, about 50% of all your incident cases are recorded in four months. And based on that, these districts were selected. So you see that when we are going in the elimination, it should be more of innovation and then looking at where the intervention is actually need needed. Now, this is busy, but it's important that we have a look at this uh, figure. It comes to seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis. The target population for Bunei was 85,341. And we were supposed to register the actual number of children under five that we could register in Bunei was 63,841. And that represented about 75%. And straight away, you could see that this is below the target for the region because the region was supposed to register 90%. Now, when it comes to coverage, if you look at the target population of 76,807, that we're supposed to move, the region was 
able to dose only six to two thousand three hundred and seventeen, which is translated into only eighty five percent dosing coverage. But the target for the program was supposed to be ninety percent. So you could see straight away we were not able to achieve the target. Now, if you then break it down to the district level, you can see that none of the districts was able to really achieve the target registration. So you can see Pro is 88.7, Sene is 83.5. All of them, none of them could do that. But then when it came to the coverage, realized that only two districts were able to make, achieve the coverage through East and Sine East. So it is for a region to begin to look and ask questions. You need a strong leadership and data use to really look at what is really happening and so that you can take a decision. So this is the first thing as a region we decided to do, drill it down and look at where the problems are. And not only that, what is causing the problems that we are seeing. So we just rank the districts in terms of coverage. The district that did very well was through East, and the one that could not perform very well was through West. It's important we do this, because if you don't really do this, you will not be able to look and prioritize and look at where, as a region, we really have to focus our attention and address it. And this should be a reminder for us as we go through the elimination that look. The action is at the site of implementation, at the regional, at the sub and at the district level. So armed with this information, what all the districts were tasked to do was really, really to look at the causes of the performance. And they had different ways of doing that. And this is one of, of the two that through it. I'm using through it as a almost all their districts and that took this activity. So through is then decided to look at what was the possible cause of what we were seeing. And so they used this fishbowl to be able to do that. And you can see when they were looking at the possible, and definitely we can't do this at the regional level. And obviously you can't do it at the national level. It has to be done at where the action is taking place. So let's start down, look at all the areas that can contribute to the poor performance and came with a broad ranges. So I'll just pick only one of them. So they were looking at leadership. Was the problem to do volunteers? Was it at the community level? Was it at the policy level? They drill all these down. And so I will put on the volunteers. For example, the challenge that they came with was poor target setting for volunteers. So because in 2021, the district could not set targets for the volunteers, that contributed to that poor performance. And so I'm just lifting that for us to see what they went ahead to do. And this went across all the districts. So then they use this, what we call the five whys. So the first question they asked was that, they couldn't, they didn't have no daily target setting to guide the process. And that's contributed to the volunteers not performing very well. And the question is why? Why was that supervisors did not have daily targets for themselves? And the question is why? This is what we call the five why. The coordinators who are supposed to supervise these supervisors themselves did not have targets. And the question is why? The districts themselves did not have targets. And then the question is why the region did not give targets to them. And this is what we call a doing root cause analysis. And the moment they arrive at the root cause of the problem, that because the districts were not giving targets, that contributed to that. So the change I did there was what every district was supposed to be given targets. Coordinators then will give targets. Supervisors then will give targets. This will be translated to volunteer. So that is the change idea. So you could straight away see this graph. When they instituted the change idea, you can see from the December 
for 2022. And when we began the campaign in 2022, you can see this is what we call a run chart. And it's telling us the processes, showing us a clear improvement in terms of the dosing. So you can see what is telling us that look. When they implement the change idea at the local level, there was a drastic improvement and then they were able to meet the target. So that's what we, we see. So almost every district after analysis came with a major challenge. So you can see all the districts are left in Tampa. All of them were able to identify major challenges. All of them put in a change idea and we had a remark. So you can see in, in graphical terms, when you look at the 2022, after the intervention, you can see the re registration coverage between 2021 and 2022. Through East for 2021, they were able to register 88.7%, low what the 90. But with these interventions put in place, change idea, look at what they were able to do. They were able to do more than 90%. That goes It, it cuts across the way at 22. Let's look at the let's look at the coverage. Let's look at the cover in That is what the change I, I did. And this is some of the proof is sitting down to analyze the problems and then implement a change idea. So that's what we we will see. Now the summary that I will, we just put across is that look. Evidence and law is not enough for zero malaria unless the evidence are what's taken into consideration the context. So you are still introducing malaria surveillance. Okay, you are going to introduce uh, IPT. You are going to use mass drug administration. Yes, but we have to look at the context across all the country, and this definitely calls for what innovation at all levels, leadership at all levels. Therefore, we need to spearhead this activity and then continuously use data for decision making. If you really mean business in terms of elimination, making sure there is zero transmission and no re-establishment of infection. Uh, I would want to acknowledge the district directors, medical, national malaria, UHAS, and Ghana Health Service uh, leadership. Thank you, over. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Fred Adumako Boating. He went straight to the point. And um, I wouldn't want to belabor the points he has already made. I think that we've been here for a while. And we have had four presenters um, give us their presentations. And I believe that we would have some questions. We would have some things we would want some clarification on. And so we would want to give all of us the opportunity to do that. If you want to ask a question, kindly raise your hand and then we would um, mention your name to do that. If you want to raise your hand, go to more and then you would see reactions. If you, 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 you click on more, you will see reactions and then you will see raise your hand, then you can do that. So please, we give you the opportunity to do that. But um, before we, we go on with the raising of hands, there's one, um, um, there's one question. Over here from Greg Amenu Vegbe. I, I hope I'm, I did well with the mentioning of your name, Greg. Okay, so um, Greg, Eva here, can you unmute yourself and then you can ask your question? Greg Amenu Vegbe. Greg okay. Amenu Vegbe. If you're here, kindly unmute, unmute yourself and ask your question, and then we'll move on to the rest. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, like my name is Greg Amanuvegbe. Um, mm -hmm. 
like I uh, I said, thanks so much for all the presenters, especially my own uh, father, Prof. Binka. I just want to know uh, if there if there is a, a strategic something from the program now uh, to fit our diseradication technique into the platforms of the various political parties who will soon be moving from one um, end of the country to the other, every hamlet, so that uh, we'll see how we can also use them to carry out this elimination or te eradication techniques to reach out people and what we expect from them uh, to do. Uh, this is what I just want to ask from the program. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, um, we will take um, two more questions and then we will get our presenter respond to them, please. Um, we have here Eric Nanatechi um, Abian. I think you would also want to ask a question. So, um, Eric, um, can you? Yeah. Please all right i hope i'm loud yes you are yeah so i thank all the presenters for the good work they have done but my question is um you know now that we are going into active surveillance in the low performing areas you know surveillance is capital intensive like for example some of us you are working in island communities where the cost of assessing the communities is very very high so in case a case is reported and we have to send an investigation team to get there. How is it going to be funded? Because it's capital intensive. And then the second one is also about surveillance at the borders. One, I want to know if the borders around us, I mean, the other countries uh, sharing boundaries with Ghana, are they also targeting the same elimination phase of the malaria? If no, and then, you know, like where I am, I'm the digital director for KJB and we share border with Togo. Sometimes I go to Togo, to eat and I come to Ghana to sleep. So you see, so assuming I go there and I catch the infection and I bring it to Ghana, I'm not going to am I not going to spread it in case malaria, in case our mosquitoes are around here. So in that case, at the borders, are we going to mount surveillance points where we screen people who are moving up and down so that in case you are positive, they try to ride there to provide the necessary treatment before you enter the another country. I want to know the plans about it. Thank you. All right, Sani, thank you very much. Then we'll take um, Suleimana um, Abubakari. Suleimana Abubakari. Yeah, thank you very much, Chair. As rightly mentioned, I'm Suleiman Abubakari from Kintampo Research Center. And uh, I would like to start by first of all thanking all the presenters. I think, in my estimation, estimation they did very well. Um, but then uh, my question, I think, goes more to Provinka, and then uh, this is more of me thinking aloud. I'm looking at the emphasis on the domestic funding and then uh, where Ghana finds itself now, uh, I mean, with the economic challenges. And as I think through it, my intuition is that uh, probably we should not be looking at the entire country, but to focus on the area, I mean, the, the places to flow malaria and then see how in our own small way, uh, we can do something, especially in these trying times. But then uh, I wanted Prof's take on that. And then as to whether we really costed how much is going to uh, be needed in terms of funding to be able to eliminate malaria in Ghana. Thank you, Nenova. Thank you very much, um, Suleimana. Um, we'll take one last one. I said one last one initially, but um, we'll take one last one. That is from Sunny, um, Sunny, you are song. Sunny, you are Kindly bring your hand down. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much for the opportunity to also present my concern. 
And I must also thank the presenters, especially Professor Evelyn and M. Prof. Binka, who are both my lecturers, and Binka was my supervisor, for the brilliant and then inside presentation they have given to us. This morning. I think going forward, the El Nation, we may not be able to achieve the, 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 the target. And the other concern I want to raise going forward with the El Nation strategy is that currently some lower level facilities like the health centers or even chip zones have challenges with stocking with the anti due to the fact that they are financial claims. And then apart from that, the strategy of uh, the SMC, which started in Upper West region, is also so great looking at the results from where we started from 2014 up to now, uh, 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 mobility. But with the current uh, financial challenges, year in, year out, the uh, number of volunteers and other resources keep on dwindling. And that has become a big challenge because from where I am working in the Upper West region, we realized that from the initial start where volunteers were enough, uh, at least a large number of volunteers were given to the region or districts, the coverages were quite good and volunteers were more committed in delivering the, the expected Uh, coverage okay, because they were places to administer the, the, the drug treaties. Yes, so but the challenge now is because of the redu reduction in numbers, volunteers these days uh, adopt the strategy of just giving out the, the blisters. Maybe the first day they, they, they do the dot, but the subsequent one they are unable to go up because they have a larger area to cover because of the few numbers. So going forward, I think the elimination program need to look at the uh, uh, anti-malaria uh, supplies as well as the number of teams for the SMC so that we can have a very good uh, implementation uh, strategies. Thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. Thank you, Sunny. So um, we'll now give the opportunity to our presenters, our four presenters, to respond to um, the questions and the issues that have been raised. Thank you. Probably Prof. Binka would go first. It seems like a lot of um, the issues were addressed to him. So Prof, if you are around, kindly respond to the issues that um, they have raised. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I didn't hear most of Sunny's uh, questions, uh, but I think he was looking at the issues of funding and the uh, economic situation and how to deploy those interventions that they are at the moment. So my uh, answers are straightforward. Let me let me start with uh, Greg. I think that is in the domain of uh, Dr. Mam. Dr. Mam will tell us whether they have any strategic uh, listen to uh, look at all the political parties, and I think they must because if you get this into their uh, by next year, all of these guys will be having their uh, manifestos, and I hope you will get them to commit to uh, the malaria elimination effort. Island communities and the borders, yes, uh, those are new challenges, but those challenges are also the time for you to rise up. Um, this is a, an information-driven effort. So when you start, you first of all have to uh, uh, what document that these are where the major uh, uh, foci are. And then you will find that if you go through the whole process of cutting down transmission, you may not need to go to those islands every uh, more than maybe once or twice a week because you are giving a holistic approach. First, treating those who are sick because you've tested them. Secondly, you are also dealing with the transmission, potential transmission areas. Even in island settings, the uh, vectors don't, uh, are not critically in the swimming areas. They, they, they do look for the puddles of water 
where Aranopolis Gambi tends to breed. It doesn't breed in the, in the middle of the river or in the dam. So that should, uh, the, I, I, I think that, uh, and I will say this very emphatically, that the information gathering process should be the key. So that at the end of the week, you are able to map out where your cases are coming from, okay? Both with the border, you may find out that the border might not be the issue. Actually, um, during the COVID, I led a team that went to Afrao to do some testing of uh, people who were crossing the border. Um, the government had closed the borders and the people who reacted saying, why are you here? Because the borders are closed. But under all of that, we are able to demonstrate that only 3% of the people who were crossing the borders, and these were thousands of people, were positive. So the problem was not with those who were crossing, and we had just closed the border for nothing. Okay, so the, the message here is that surveillance. Once you detect, you will find ways in dealing with that. Okay, so I won't be labeled that at uh, that point. So yes, go to Togo and have your lunch and come and sleep in Ghana. But if you then got the case, uh, gradually, as you inform your border counterparts in the other side, they might also get interested that this is what Ghana is doing. How can they work with you to try and deal with that? I know, for example, in the Upper West, Burkina Faso is doing the SMC. Are you doing it at the same time or you are doing it at different times? So if they are doing SMC and you're also doing SMC, you will decide that, okay, let's start at the same time so that we cover a geographical area. You going into Burkina from the Ghana border and the Ghana border being it from the border with Burkina Faso back into Ghana. So this re-emphasizes the district level decision making based on the evidence that is available. And if you are doing that now, you will be making the logistics demand. How many tablets? of anti malarias do you need? How many dipsticks? This has to be done well, not what I did last year plus 10%. Uh, you will do it based on the information that you have. So that's my next point. And, and, and these are the discussions that we shall have uh, as we go along. Let me assure you that once you are in the lead in the districts and you put this down with your workers, they will come up with the solutions that makes you go Further. And I think that ties on with Suleiman's domestic funding issue. Look, you have to mobilize the people in your districts. I'm sure the filling station, uh, owner of the filling station in one district might say, ah, if this will cut down on malaria, why wouldn't I put in some uh, money to help them to do what they do? We can raise local money. We are not raising millions for the little things, even if it gives you fuel to be able to go around. That's a contribution that he makes. And then you highlight it for the community. You must find local solutions. And that's why the leadership must be passed on to you. I can assure you, you'll be surprised that somebody might find what you have to do with the school children and make sure that the children are not sick of malaria every day. You know, so this is part of our whole uh, drive. Own it, bring the people together. This is not a health. Uh, only problem. It is a community problem. And when you cut down on uh, the infection and the transmission within your community, you will see how people will come and join the effort. And that is what we are trying to uh, we are trying to pass on. Sunny, I think I've answered some of your questions. What I'm saying is that, look, there are volunteers. Yes, today you're having problems with uh, super, supervising the IPT P3 doses. Have you talked about finding a woman in the village there who will supervise when the people are gone? There's somebody in the community who will say, okay, I'm ready to do that. So come up with your local solutions. If I were in that district, I would get the queen mother or the leader of the woman to make sure that hey, this morning at nine, everybody should come to my house, come with your drugs. I want to see you take the, uh, the drugs. Then the, the volunteers have deposited that I have a different person helping them to improve on their own health is their health. And most people will make a contribution. So let's, let's try it. 
let's put this before the, the district. Let's get the national people to reorient themselves and say, we are here to support you. We are here to give you uh, all the backing that you need. There are limits, but let's try one strategy after another. And then others will come and learn from you. But I can assure you it's doable. It's done in other countries and life really, uh, people like to see results. Once you are demonstrating the results, you the, the community will be very happy. Remember, it's not only giving drugs, it's not only giving insecticide. You should be reporting to the community how many cases of malaria you found in the community. We never go back to tell them what we are doing. So they don't see the impact. You know, why can't there be a deva once every month where you show the improvements that have come because of your little efforts? Then they will help to push and make sure that those little efforts become a big ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we would ask um, Dr. Maum if um, she would um, respond to some of the issues that were raised, please. Um, uh, Prof, thank you for doing my work for me. Actually, I was, I was uh, let me start from Suleiman's point. And I think he was saying we can't, he doesn't think we can't eliminate. And you see, elimination is a process. It's not today. In the, if you look at the problems you have, you say you can't do anything. And I remember when we started with a mass campaign and wanted to digitize it. I still remember at Dodua when we started and some people said, no, Dr. Ma, it won't work. So let's do, let's digitize and then still have the manual by it and see if it work. And we said, no, we will try it and try it fully. So we piloted it in two districts in Eastern region, two districts in Volta, found the issues, improved on it and scaled up. And today, not only have we digitized our, digitized our mass campaign, every intervention that we do on the field is digitized. We don't collect manual data from supervision to SMC, to Laval source management, all the data is right away digitized. So I believe that when we see the problems, the onus lies on us to find the solutions to the problems, but not to look at the problems and say we can't do it. We are not saying the whole of Ghana will eliminate malaria by next year. What we are saying is that we want to get malaria out of Ghana. And by so doing, we are going to zone the country and move progressively. But it's a whole paradigm shift. And that's what Prof is saying. No district will be waiting for malaria control program to bring money in a box to them to work. No. I, I will have a role, you will have a role, and we'll all play our role to make sure that we win this fight. Some of our roles is what we are doing now, giving you the information, leading the agenda, things that I have to do at the national level will be done. The things that Dr. Aduma Kubwatin will have to do at the regional level will be done. The thing that the district director Everybody has a role. And I'm glad Prof raised the point about local resource mobilization. Lo and Dr. Adumako Boatin raised the point about local innovation because we need to contextualize it and make it possible. We are indeed going to work to make sure that political parties put the malaria agenda in their, in their um, manifestos. In fact, I know Prof has even started working on some of the parties already. So it's work in progress. And all we are saying is that we are starting and the problems shouldn't stop us from starting and pushing on. Over, Madam Chair. Thank you First, very much. I think there was a question on the cost of elimination. Yes, we are working on the strategic plan and then we'll be able to have the final cost soon. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Maum. So I uh, would we'll ask Prof. Sansa um, to also add her voice to um, the questions before we move on to the next set of questions. Okay, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I think um, where Dr. Maum started from is where I really need to go. The battle that we are in or the fight to eliminate malaria cannot start with, we can't do it. If it starts with we can't do it, we would have defeated ourselves even before we, 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 we start. And that's why I talked about 
eliminating malaria household by household, community by community, sub-district by sub-district. Let's just do it in the environment where we are. Look at the resources there. One of the things we will need to begin to do is to hold community leaders accountable. But we can only hold them accountable if we show them the data and then they monitor the data with us. If you remember from COVID, there was this very simple dashboard. Everybody could understand it. How many people have had COVID? How many have died? How many are still alive? Everybody could understand it. If we have simple data that is usable at different levels and make it in a form that people can understand, people will monitor their own data. They will be moved to do things like the Queen Mother gathering people to take their drugs because she doesn't want malaria in her backyard. If we do that in and set these things up and uh, get people into this mindset, we will be able to do it. Community by community, sub-district by sub-district, district by district, region by region, and finally nationally. We can't do it in a day, but we will do it step by step, step by step. We will push malaria out if we make up our mind to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Prof. Thank you very much, Prof. So we have a few more hands up, and then we are going to mention their names and they will give their questions. I have here Ajay Kumi. Ajay Kumi, are you there? Yes, I'm yes. here. Thank you very much. Okay. And thank you for organizing this. I was here last year, and I must say this year is uh, quite an improvement. Thank you. So I have a question to Dr. Kezia. Um, on the presentation she presented, there was a slide where you were talking about coverage and stuff. And then uh, at a vector control, I saw one slide where it was lava source. And I wanted to know if that intervention is a standalone intervention in these areas. And then if there are standalone interventions, to how are these resource measured? as to the uh, implications on how these interventions are actually working. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will have the next uh, person, Dr. Mary Ekwampuma. Dr. Mary Ekwampuma, please, can we have your question? Yes, so um, thank you for this um, insightful discussion and deliberation. My question is, I think um, um, elimination is possible uh, but because of this um, World Malaria Day. I've had a lot of engagement thanks to Professor Ansa. I'm in Hohoi, um, FNBSPH um, of UHAS. And I've had a lot of engagement with the community, the Hohoi community. And I know that elimination is possible, but I think that um, education is key because from their narrative, it looks as if, okay, we are looking at um, maybe the vaccine, which is good. But I also think that even um, individuals knowing symptoms of malaria, uh, some of them didn't know the symptoms and the signs of malaria. And thanks to my Dean and Prof um, Ansa, we, we had a radio program just on signs and symptoms of ma malaria so that they would they would understand in their local language so that they will understand um, and also know some of these things. So I'm just saying that, um, yes, it's possible, vaccine is great, and the other things that also, we should also look at education, using their own language to educate them about um, malaria, the signs and symptoms. Then my second um, contribution that I also want to make is about the vaccine. Uh, we know the narrative about vaccination. So I'm thinking that, yes, um, we will roll it out um, very soon in large quantities, but we should also look at uh, some of the stigma to vaccination. Maybe there will be some stigma to this particular, uh, some, not, not everybody, but some people will have stigma towards this malaria vaccine that we are supposed to explore and know how to navigate it before we roll it out in large quantities. So thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Ampuma. 
uh, we will now call on Samuel, but um, kindly make yourself as brief as possible. And then our presenters would also um, respond as briefly as possible because all, all our time is um, running out. Um, I believe we have enjoyed the session and so we want to keep being. So um, Sam, um, Samuel Atta, you would have uh, <coughs> briefly, and then when we finish, we'll take the last set of um, the participants asking questions and then we'll be closing. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Samuel. Yeah, very powerful and excellent presentations. I'm, I'm, I'm speaking from East region, specifically Lower Mania Krobo and S a CSU. So here I'm adding my voice, uh, malaria eradication is key. And we are beside the lake, Vota Lake here, the Krobo zone, Akuse as the malaria prom area, they do plant this rice, bomb to Upper Mania. So here, I'm adding my voice that uh, as CSOs, Coalition of Edges in Health, where are we so that we can also facilitate and advocate for the reduction of malaria within the nation as well as East region and then my Krubozo. That's what I want to add. Um, thank you very much. Um, it was a comment you made, so. Dr. Mam, okay. So Dr. Mam um, would uh, um, take that. And so when we finish with this, then we take the next set of questions. So Dr. Mam, um, Professor Vinka, can you please respond to um, Mr. Ajay Kumi, Dr. Ampoma, and uh, Mr. Samuelata? Okay, I can. Uh, uh, Vinka, yes. Dr. Uh, Mam will talk about the coverage of the uh, what Lavisiding it. Uh, but the general question is the, the general policy is that from now onwards, everything must be uh, reported. So I think they are digitizing those data also, and that data should be available to the people in the district so that they can use that to make their, their contributions. And Dr. Ekwampoma made a contribution i completely accept that and i think what you just said shows that uh, every district must come up with some of the things that are pertaining to their own area provide information and education in the languages that are spoken there and make sure that people are participating in all of this and uh, the local radio stations are now many if you are the district where there's a radio station you must talk to them for them to give some time for uh, the corporate social, whatever they call it, so that people can ask questions and you can uh, then uh, give answers. Uh, we see the market people taking over the line. This is the time the malaria people and the health people must develop uh, these at activities. As for the Krobo zone, I think uh, this effort is trying to bring the focus onto the districts. So I'm sure Dr. Keziaman will tell you a little bit more about the Krobo area. So we are now pushing the leadership to you and you must get ready working with the CSOs like you to bring the people together. And as I've said, every district will have to choose who, who leads. And the ministry that will be performing the role of secretary is the CSOs the other health sector people must be in the lead so that you bring the community together. And then it's not necessarily that people are sick, but we are protecting people from getting sick. So th th that's my contribution. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Binka. Um, Dr. Mao, would you want to...
mentions going on as well, right? But our whole focus is it, bringing down malaria. So when we put in all these, we've tested to know these interventions work and we put in all that, we focus on at the end of all that, how much malaria do we have now? Is it coming down? So that's what we do. Um, um, doc, Dr. Um, um, Puma, or I hope I got the name right. Thank you for the thing on education. And it just, that's Dr. Mary here. It just shows that we all have to do something at where we are. So I'm happy that you took the role and Prof. Ansan and you did something where you are to, to fight this disease. We can't do it all as a program. Malaria vaccine hesitancy is real. But just to know, I think I mentioned that we've already started the rollout of malaria vaccine and we had 70%. So we'll continue to address the issue around vaccine hesitancy but we'll continue to make sure that um, we are able to roll it out to save lives when um, new ones or when even the existing ones, we have more becoming available. Um, thank you and over. We'll continue to work with our NGOs as well. It would make sure that the fight is not one-sided, but everybody has his or her hand on the bit. Thank you very much, Dr. Mal. I would also ask him, Dr. Fred Adumanko Boateng, if you would want to comment on the role of the CSOs. Okay. Thank you. So I think uh, it comes back to what we are saying uh, that, look, when it comes to elimination, there should be active engagement across all levels. Look, I am the regional director for Greens with 11 districts. But I cannot really identify the problem as Sine is unless the leadership of Bunu is put their hands to the wheel. When we come to Bunu is, some of the communities are island communities. Some you have to be on the boat for four hours before you get to. So I, you cannot sit here. All these sub districts, communities, you really have to do a proper micro planning together with the community. So that all of you are on the same page and these are collated together. This process should not be truncated. And those who are going to lead it is the leaders at all these levels. That's what we are saying. Look, any intervention, vaccine hesitancy is not a new thing, but across the country, it's not the same. The minute details from all, when it comes to elimination, should be very important. And that's what I will see. No matter what you are going to do, you should be able to put it in context so that if me as a regional director cannot even look at 16, uh, 11 districts, how much a program uh, coordinator, a uh, program manager. So that's what we will have to be thinking into as leaders at all. That's what uh, I will add to that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Admaku Um, I think we have the last set of um, questions. And so I'll mention the names of all the people. We have um, five people in all. Kindly make your questions as very brief as possible. And then we'll have our facilitators take us through them very briefly, and then we'll be ending our program. So I have here, Dinah, I would say, and then kindly note, it would come in that order. We would have Dinah, I would say, we would have Dorcas. I have Akpene um, Nyamadi, and then Roland Glover, and Isaka Haisan. Isaka Haisan. So it goes in that order. Dinah would come first, Dorcas, Akpene, um, Roland, and then Isaka, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Hello. Hello, Dinah. Please go ahead. Hello. Can I speak? Yes, please, Dinah. Please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Mine is not a, a question, but a contribution based on observation made on the field. Uh, my contribution is that uh, as much as we are trying to reduce malaria and eliminate it, we have to focus also on the policies that we are bringing out and strengthen its implementation. When you come to the hospital set out, we said the treaties, 
we said test, treat, and track. But actually in application or on the food, that is not what is happening. When the client comes and they find out it's not malaria because there is no other. Diana, can you Hello? be very brief? Be very brief, please. Okay. Please be you very realize, Okay. You realize that uh, there are no other laboratory checks that they can do for the client. So they end up treating malaria or giving malaria drugs despite the fact that it is no malaria that has been found using the IBT. So if we can shred in our laboratory system alongside, which has mm -hmm. tests for other fevers, okay. that can also help us. In addition to the NHIF policies, which is also a contributing factor to Okay, Diana, I think your point is well made. Your point is well made. Thank you very much. Can we have Dorcas, please? Dorcas. And please be very brief, Dorcas, if you are there. Is Dorcas there? Okay, Dorcas is not here. And um, can we have Akpene um, Nyamedi? Akpene Nyamedi. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. I actually typed my question in the Q&A section but well if you are calling me let me just read it out so um, maybe to save time i've started responding to your questions there i think i just responded to one so uh -huh. you don't need to that one okay mm. Thank you. Thank you. so then i think um, there are questions roland has his, um questions there also yeah. can we have isaka who had his hand up isaka I think he's okay. Oh, okay. So, um, Roland, okay. So, we have Roland here. He says, um, please, is there something you have to share on community level leadership in malaria in nation from China, Miami, etc.? That's to Prof. Binka. Yes, that's to Prof. Binka. So, but I think he did. Um, he did. He shared. he shared it. I think yes. Roland, he shared um, that, but Prof, maybe you can briefly um, talk about that before we close. Okay, I'll do that. Let's get everybody to ask his questions first, then we start responding. Um, I think we are done. Those who are, the others are being answered, so we just have this one for you to answer, then we will. Okay. Okay, I'll do that. So thank you very much. Yeah, so in uh, Myanmar and, in, and uh, in China, they go through the same processes like we are doing here. They are village setups, but theirs is a more regimented system where the law works and they use both the stick and the carrot. Uh, so if they say everybody should come for the vaccines, everybody will show up for the vaccines and they check those who don't show up and then they go after them. But they also provide support to people where they work. So the farmers and so on. So at the moment, for example, there's war in Myanmar. So the Chinese are running clinics at the border in Myanmar to make sure that those people around them don't get the malaria and don't bring it into China. Okay, so if we get advanced, maybe we shall also be providing support at the Togo border or the Burkina Faso border. But they go to the same processes. They are about the same levels in the rural areas like we have, and they make a contribution. They are very observant and they are ready to make a discussion and provide their own solutions. The other good thing about the, uh, the, the Chinese in particular, when you go to a village doctor, uh, he, he, he's worked there throughout his life as a village doctor. He inherited it from his father and his father from his grandfather. So everybody knows him. He's the person who tells them what to do and they go to him when they have their problems. So we can do it. We, 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 we just have to try. We should not approach this with, oh, it can't be done. Oh, it's too difficult. No, let's apply what we know the solutions not all of them will work 
but we sh should be in a position to substitute our new um, strategies and make sure that it works. So in my concluding this thing, yes, we can, we can eradicate malaria with the tools today if we okay. all put our hands on deck. Thank you. <laughs> Yes, thank you very much for Binka. And, and I also say, yes, we can. And I think the program manager said the same. And we are happy that you were all able to join in in this meeting. We have people from Harvard University um, listening to us as well, who are also interested in malaria, listening to our coming major is online. And we are happy that everybody is taking the bull by the horns. We will, yes, Carmen is clapping for us and we will be, um, we will be sending to you the newsletter that um, we have, we'll send it by email to all of you because you registered. And then this recording, we are recording this interaction and it will be available also, um, you could use the email address that we have at the end of the newsletter to send a message and we can send you the recording if you need to go back to it. We want this to be a, we want everybody to get the information. We need to move together as one group and move together to achieve elimination. We can't do it individually, we have to go together. So um, we thank you very much. Um, Carmen, if you just put all on your camera and say hello, to people, um, she's responsible for a lot of the capacity building that goes on in malaria. Um, so just to say hello, are you there, Carmen? Hello. I think she can't um, you she she waits. I am so here. I have very poor lighting, so I apologize. It's not going to be very ah, sorry, let me see if I can fix this. Okay. But yes, congratulations. This has been a wonderful program and I am so thrilled that I was able to join it. So thank you so much, all the presenters and such really deep questions. And I'm excited um, for the progress ahead. Thank you very much, Carmen. Yes, hello, Carmen. I'm sure she's known to all the presenters. So I'll hand over now to um, Dr. Edu, a university librarian, appropriately so, and then she'll do her closing remarks and we'll have a closing prayer and then we'll be out of here. Okay. Prof, just, just yes. one comment before the Please. chairman speaks because I can't speak when the chairman speaks. Just to thank you. Thank you um, for inviting us to this seminar. Thank you for the work that you do. And thank to all the participants. Yes, we can. I see that just coming up um, on on the chat box and we are grateful. There's a lot of work to do. This is not going to be a talk show. We all have to do something wherever we are to make sure that we, we can do this. And Dr. Dumako Boatin too, thank you for working with us. Over Prof. Thank you. Thank you all for um, honoring the invitation. If you hadn't been here, this would not have happened. So thank you, Prof. Binka. Thank you, Dr. Mam. Thank you, Dr. Dumako Boatin. Thank you all the participants. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We can't say thank you enough. Yes, we can. Thank you, uh, thank, thank you. you, thank you. Yeah, thank you. yes, we can. I think that there are a few things we, uh, we can take home. The, one of the things is that leaders must be leaders. Leaders must be leaders. And then this whole work, if we can do it and do it very well, it has to be a multi-sectoral job. We have to have a lot of collaboration so that we can do it. In fact, we have examples of other countries that have done it. We have been given um, examples from China, Myanmar, Cambodia, etc. And I believe that if we put our hands to it, we should be able to do it. We have talked about the fact that we need to um, increase logistics into this, we need to push for that as well. We've talked about the fact that we need to get our politicians to commit to this um, very, very important thing. One of the things, cliches that uh, we all know is that um, health is wealth. 
health is wealth. And so as a people, if we are not healthy, then definitely we cannot be wealthy. If you are sick all the time, you cannot go to work, you cannot make your business run and all that. And so we need to ensure that we have our planning in place. We need to ensure that we gather the right kind of information and we need to ensure the right people together and then to push this, this agenda forward. We can eliminate malaria from Ghana. We can do it. And on this note, I'll say a very big thank you for the organizers of this program for giving all of us the opportunity to come and meet with all of you wonderful participants. We thank um, Professor Binka, we, we thank Professor um, um, Ansan, we, th we thank Dr. Mao, and then we also thank um, Dr. Adumako Boateng um, for the great job they, are, they have done. Um, God willing, next year, I believe we'll be able to um, come again and then we can um, sit around and discuss. But this time round, we'll be talking about all the positive things we have achieved um, during the year before 2024. Um, would now call on um, Dr. Maryam, um, our lecturer from the um, Ahohoi campus, the Fred Binka um, School of Public Health. School of Public Health would call on her to give us the closing prayer. Dr. Ampoma, please. Um, Thank you. Thanks so much. And I want everybody have a nice very inside. First pray. Father, we thank you for us. Thank you for us to organize a first deliberate this topic for this World Malaria uh, Day celebration. Father, you said wisdom belongs to you. As we discuss on investment, as we discuss on innovation, as we discuss implementation, feed us, come out invention that will help us to an area period and also uh, that will lead us to an elimination and even eradication. And now champion this sport. We champion this sport. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. 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 You receive your virtual. <laughs> Amen. Bye bye. Let's take a quick picture and then we will be out of here. Holland, are you there? <laughs> yes. all of you. Okay. So, yes. Taking this first page, we... So, they are almost done. I think we've taken this. And then the final page. Yes, we've taken. So good, um, good afternoon and have a good day. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you, um, Bye. Director General. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Fosun. I see you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Director General. Director General was in our midst. Oh, we didn't see him. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Fosu. Thank you, Dr. Fosu. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Fosu. Yeah. Bye, Doc. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Dr. Fosu. Thank you so much for spending time with us.
Tchau, tchau.